Good morning. It is January <laughs> Friday, the 22nd of January, 2021. This is Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, and uh, this morning's topic is civil trials and how that uh, is impacting. Um, we talked last week about criminal trials and the impact on the system. And this week we're talking about civil trials, looking at any legislation that we might do that would help move this process along, uh, recognizing that COVID-19 has uh, created more of a backlog than was already there. I think we're well aware that there was a tremendous backlog in civil cases before COVID-19 hit. Now it's been exasperated. So uh, our first witness is Christopher Maley, uh, representing the Vermont Association for Justice. Chris, uh, take it away, please. Uh, hi, this is actually Greg Weimer. I'm uh, oh. starting in front of Chris today. Yeah, Greg. Okay. Well. So I am uh, uh, the chair of the Bar Association's Practice and Procedure Committee. And uh, Terry asked me to appear today to uh, give you guys uh, some anecdotal evidence of how this backlog is affecting the practice. And uh, I'm also by happenstance on the Bar Association's COVID-19 committee. Uh, and we recently did a survey with the bar, uh, you know, feeling out some of these issues and we got some interesting results. I will say uh, out of 2,200 members roughly, we had only 275 responses or so. So it probably doesn't qualify as a scientifically valid poll, but I think it still provides some interesting anecdotal um, information for you to consider. So with respect to the economic impact, 55% uh, of our respondents reported that they've had an adverse impact on cash flow and billable work as a result of the pandemic. We didn't parse out exactly how much of that would be related to the lack of jury trials going on, but I suspect that it, it does play a pretty significant role, uh, in, you know, for anyone who litigates, obviously, with the courts in, in their current condition, it's going to impact their overall ability to, you know, process cases and get, get work done. Uh, Additionally, about 30% of the law offices reported receiving the payroll protection plan loans, which I think is another indicator of, you know, the kind of impact that's been uh, taking place. Uh, in terms of the attorney well-being, 70% reported feeling isolated and about 60% reported feeling worried or afraid. And I think, the, you know, it's, it's important to keep in context, not just the lack of jury trials, but the overall effect that this is having, because I think that plays into uh, the overall practice of law here. Uh, we did receive some individual statements from people who took part in the poll. Um, and some people are really, the, the gist of it is that some people are really struggling uh, to cope with this. And so uh, I think anything we can do to help, you know, get cases rolling through the courts in a more normal fashion, the sooner we can do that, I think the better it will be for the overall uh, health and, and welfare for the bar at large. Uh, my personal anecdotal experience with the practice has been that cases are obviously languishing and it brings to mind the old adage that justice delay is justice denied. Uh, my experience has been that the, the process of working a case through from soup to nuts in terms of discovery has certainly suffered uh, because there's no feeling of pressure for parties to get things done in a timely manner. So I've seen a real drop off in the lack of prompt responses to discovery requests. Um, I, I think it's a case where, uh, you know, if you have a task, it, it expands to fill the available time. And I think that's one of the situations here is that people don't feel that pressure of knowing that they're on a court docket that be called. And, and so cases tend to stretch out a bit more because of that. Uh, it's certainly not more efficient. And I think, you know, in, in terms of cases running longer, it all ultimately is going to cost the clients more to get things resolved. <clears throat> um, and I, you know, I don't think that this is a situation where 
solely plaintiffs are harmed. I think there's also some harm to defendants as well in civil cases. Uh, for example, interest rates on known damages continue to accrue at 12% a year. Uh, and that's really through no fault of any party. It's just the fact of the matter is that cases aren't getting resolved. Could you, uh, could you, uh, could you please um, expand on that 12% a year and the interest rates and how that impacts litigants? Sure. So uh, take, for example, in a personal injury case, if a person has an, a known and quantifiable amount of uh, hard damages, such as medical bills, <laughs> Prejudgment interest under the statute begins to run when the case is filed, and the statutory interest rate amount is 12% a year. So the longer these cases take to resolve through no fault of the parties, that interest continues to run and will be collectible ultimately when any judgment is rendered. Um, so that's a potential uh, problem for litigants that you know they have to incur that expense through no fault of their own. <clears throat> So uh, I'm not sure what this, what this uh, committee is considering in terms of a resolution. Uh, the, the Vermont Bars Association's position is essentially that we understand the problem, we think it's significant, uh, but we do have a, a lack of consensus in the members. So we don't propose a solution ourselves, but we're very interested in hearing, uh, you know, what a, a thoughtful review and a potential resolution might look like so that we can present it to our membership and see if we can form some kind of consensus <clears throat> to get behind that. But we are very much interested in that's trying about, to get this. I, with all due respect, sir, that's pretty useless. You want us to, I, I mean, I was trying to hold a hearing today to hear your solutions, not, um, and the Mont Bar Association. I, you know, you come to us with a problem and we've tried to resolve it. E-file, for example, we have a bill in here to deal with it, but I, to, to ask us to, um, who are not practitioners of the law, um, for our solutions, I was hoping that you would offer the Vermont, excuse me, not you personally, but the Vermont Bar Association has some suggestions. And I was hoping that the Vermont Association for Justice had some suggestions. I was hoping I that so I, I kind of take offense to the idea that it's our, um, that we have solutions. I, I don't know. If you have any thoughts on how we could solve this problem, like having jury trials in alternative locations, for example, um, the Barry Auditorium, if it's sure. deemed to be appropriate, that sort of thing is what sure. I was I, hoping to hear. I certainly comment on that. I, I have seen instances in other jurisdictions, such as Florida and Texas, where they have gone to uh, remote trials. And so the, there's potential there for uh, either a hybrid trial where uh, the attorneys and clients could appear in court with sufficient uh, room and space to be safe and have the jury voir dire to take place remotely and that way we wouldn't need to have as many people in the building at the same time and then uh, proceed with the trial and have the jurors participate remotely. That would, I think, take a certain amount of economic support because uh, the potential jur jury pool would have to have access to sufficient uh, internet services and computer equipment to be able to appear sure. remote. Yep. Uh, but that is something that other states are looking at. That's that's very helpful. Um, does the CARES Act fund and or the original? I don't know what's left of the judiciary portion, but and and the latest one may have money that we can use as well. So uh, that's what I had in mind. I appreciate that suggestion. Yeah. And, and there are, you know, it's. I think it's going to be a, a, a try and see approach to see, you know, maybe try a couple of different alternatives and see what works smoothly. Maybe have a, you know. A, a sample project proceed with one trial and see what lessons can be learned from that. Uh, I think some of the potential pitfalls of that approach is uh, it's obviously not the same thing as have, having a jury during a trial where you can observe their mannerism as a group. Uh, so there, there are certain things that some trial lawyers might not find appealing about that, 
but we have to balance that against the fact that trials aren't taking place at all and uh, we have to find a way forward. Joe, did you, uh, Senator Benning had a question. Yeah, so Greg, I'm, I'm a uh, criminal defense attorney and I've been doing it for 37 years. So I, I understand things mostly from the criminal angle. Um, but it occurred to me when you spoke about doing things remotely with a jury, I can understand voir dire as long as we've got the technical support to back up a voir dire situation. But when you actually get to- Would you say place, what that is, Joe? Yeah, that's when a large group of people is brought to the courthouse and then they go through a process of being picked for a jury oh. panel. So okay. if you consider the large group of people as the jury pool, from that pool, there is a small group of people that end up on the jury panel itself after they've been questioned by the respective counsel. Um, but in the jury pool situation, that larger group of people, the technological hurdles could be fairly substantial just to make sure, for instance, here in the Northeast Kingdom, it's anybody's guess as to what your access for internet is number one, and whether or not you have equipment that's got a camera and a microphone attached to it is another problem. But it occurred to me the other day that as these waves of vaccines are being implemented, um, what do you think about the possibility of taking the first wave, those 75 and up, and developing a pool from that group? I know there are other problems that might be associated with that, but I'm just asking you to roll that around in your head for a while. Sure. To think about how do we proceed? Because this is going to be an avalanche when we are all finally vaccinated and we get back to normal. And, and you know from your work in the civil arena and I from my work in the criminal arena, there are so many cases on the back burner right now. We've never seen anything like this. So when this avalanche happens, I would prefer it to be a smaller sized avalanche if there's a way to get from here to there um, in some piecemeal fashion. And it just makes sense to me that as you develop these waves of people who are immunized, there's got to be a way, as long as the court staff are also immunized, and that includes the respective lawyers, that you begin to minimize that avalanche later on down the road. Right. And I think that's an interesting concept. Uh, one of the things I've read from other jurisdictions who have done these uh, proceedings remotely is there is sometimes a question as to whether or not you're actually getting a, a, what the law would consider a jury of your peers, especially in the criminal realm, where you're limited uh, to having people with the economic resources to have sufficient internet and computer equipment to be able to be in the jury pool. Uh, there may be a similar question as to uh, your suggestion here, using people who are in that first tranche of people getting vaccinated who would be in the uh, you know, 65 to 70 year old category, whether or not that constitutes, strictly speaking, a jury of peers. So it's a potential issue, but I think under the circumstances, it might make sense to move forward in that capacity, as you say. Otherwise, when jury trials start again, there's going to be such a backlog, there's just no way to work through them. Uh, and it's going to be a two to three year period to work through the backlog alone. So uh, I think in terms of what potential solutions are, we'll have to compromise a little bit on, on what is the normal case, right? Sure. In the criminal world, the parties could technically waive any argument about this not being a jury of my peers. I mean, I've got guys sitting in the jail right, right now. They don't care what the jury itself right. looks like. They need to have something happen so they can get out of jail. Um, so I would envision that some of them at least would be happy to have a jury, a bunch of old folks. Uh, but the bottom line is we've got nothing right now. And somebody's got to start coming up with ideas on how to solve this. Right. So, I, I think with a you know an open and knowing waiver in court, where uh, the defendants sign a, a waiver of that right in front of the judge and understand what they're doing, that I think that would be perfectly acceptable. I assume it would be for civil cases as well. Yes, I, I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, but I, I just know anecdotally that the, the defense bar pushes back 
pretty hard on a lot of these issues, especially uh, there's been uh, talk of proceeding with six persons uh, civil juries. And uh, there would almost certainly be a challenge from the defense bar if that actually took place. Uh, but as I feel, my own personal position is uh, I would like to see something done to, to address this backlog. It's just not tenable to have this continue. And by the time the general population is vaccinated, we're probably looking at another year before you know, the, the general population would be able to serve in a jury. So uh, I think your suggestion is interesting and, and should be uh, looked at. I don't know what the backlog is in the civil arena, but I'm imagining it's the same as what we're facing in the criminal arena. There is, at this moment in time, if somebody came into my office and we decided they needed a trial, I've got to tell them it could be five or six years before that ever happens. We just yeah. have no way of dealing with it otherwise. And I, I'm, I guess I'll stop. I've made my point. Yeah. Uh, Senator Baruch has a comment, of course. Uh, I, I do think that's an interesting idea, Joe. Um, I know that the committee is scheduled to hear testimony from the Department of Health on vaccines. One of the things I'm not clear in my mind about is um, apparently if you're vaccinated, you yourself are protected, but you can carry the virus still. Um, so if we were to go on thinking about this idea, it would have to be not just the people on the jury who were vaccinated, but the entire you know, human infrastructure surrounding them, That's including right others in the courthouse. And I, I, I think I, I agree with that I, is my understanding. And by the way, since you brought it up, Peggy has been working overtime trying to get the agency of human services to meet with us on this issue. And we've yet to be able to establish a time. I know that Mike Smith decided that he wanted to be the one presenting to us. And obviously he just um, is in quarantine right now. So it's difficult for him to get together with us, but we are still trying to do that. But I do think that alternative venues, um, and I know the discussion in Wyndham County was they at three courtrooms, I believe, that they were mm -hmm. planning on using, um, were criminal trials, and I think fewer jury uh, members, like six jury members, um, if, the, uh, if the parties agreed, or eight, or whatever the number is, um, might help resolve some of the Go ahead, Greg. I appreciate your time. Um, sure. Thank you. Any other comments, from Greg? Um, I understand that uh, the administrative judge has undertaken uh, uh, attempts to improve the ventilation in certain courtrooms that would help with what you just mentioned to be able to proceed perhaps with mm -hmm. smaller uh, jury pools. And I'm not sure where that project is at this point, but I know that that was something that they had in their court reopening plan. Uh, and so it, it, I think if they can make progress with that and go with smaller jury pools, then perhaps that's a way forward as well. Other questions for Greg? And Greg, you're representing Terry Corsons, is it that? Uh, yes, I'm in her stead for the Vermont Bar Association in okay. my capacity of the Practice and Procedure Committee. Okay. Um, and then we'll go on to Chris Maley. Um, Great. Thank Chris. you. Thank you, Chairman Sears. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the committee this morning and talk to you about my perspective on the civil justice system right now. And when I say mine, I also include that of the Vermont Association for Justice, which makes up about 200 trial attorneys who are bringing claims in civil cases in Vermont, and more importantly, our clients. Uh, Greg talked a little bit about the impact on attorneys. I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about the problem for Vermonters and those I represent. The threat of a civil jury trial is the leverage that makes this system work. And we don't have that leverage right now on my side of the aisle. And so what happens is uh, I, make a demand, what's called a demand for settlement. In the vast majority of cases, uh, the claimant, the Vermonter who's trying to bring a claim is going to an insurance company and saying, uh, we would like you to settle this case for X amount of money. 
it's fair trade value for the harms that you're insured caused by their negligent conduct. And let's project out what a trial would look like uh, and try to come to some kind of compromise. And that is a threat. That is a statement that says there's a, a next step. Uh, right now, the insurance industry doesn't have any worry that there's a next step. We literally are asking them to make payments out of the kindness of their heart. And you can imagine how that works. Um, the, we are at a stalemate. The message that I would like to the committee to get from the plaintiff's bar is that the system right now is broken. And it doesn't mean that cases aren't settling here and there, but they're settling in a way that is unfair, that are lower values. They have no ability to push. Um, and, you know, most cases settle at mediation. And I'm not, I, I, I think mediation is a good answer. We, we Trial is a last resort. But when you go to mediation, that process works because there is that next step to go to. And so now when you go to mediation and we're in Zoom, the mediator take, has a private session with my client and the mediator says something along the lines of what Senator Benning just said. Um, you want to go forward, right? Okay. We don't know when trial is going to happen. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know if they're, when, you know, hang on. You have mortgage payments, you have medical bills you can't pay, you have lost wages, hang on. Uh, you, you know, you, you should consider that in terms of what you're doing. And what does that do? What does that do to the system? So far, not, not good things for Vermonters. And my colleagues have the similar stories to tell. I, and I talked to the most busy mediator in the state yesterday about this. And that's a conversation that happens in all these cases. And so there are jury trials in the civil system in Vermont are rare, but that's not the important piece as much as the idea that there is a calendar with a docket, with a deadline, with a jury draw. And as Senator Benning would attest, there are courts in the state that will put 15 cases on jury draw for a certain day. Uh, in criminal context, probably a lot more. And you'll look at that list and you'll say, there's not enough hours in the day for those cases to all be uh, juries selected, but the judges know that the pressure associated with being on that list gets the parties to talk. All of a sudden there are compromises. All of a sudden there are resolutions. We don't have that. I have a case that was scheduled for trial in May. It has just languished. Nothing has happened other than an attempt for uh, opening discovery again, for more uh, work done on the defense side past all the deadlines have expired. And so what it means for plaintiffs is that they have, they have no access to justice. What it means for insurance companies is they can sit on their money. They can have it in the stock market. Uh, they can earn the great returns and they have no pressure to do anything. This is a boon for the insurance industry <laughs> pandemic and in this, uh, in this arena. And so, um, I, I'd like to pick up on Greg's part where he talked about uh, that the VBA has a hard time with uh, coming up with a position. Here, here's the real tension that's happening in Vermont. The plaintiff's bar says, let's do six. Let's do six jurors. When, when Governor Scott lifts his um, you know, safety requirements and we can get back to work, the way we can get the wheels turning faster is to have half the amount of people in there. The court officers exposed to half the amount of people when the jury draws are happening, uh, half the costs, and we can do this in a fair way. Uh, the defense says no. But, but the part that I want to leave the, the committee to be left with is that this is not a two-sided issue. These, the plaintiff's bar are the ones that are trying to get in court. The defense bar are the ones trying to say, we don't want to go to court. So this is not, the bar can figure this out on our own. What the Vermont Association for Justice has advocated, uh, I and Jim Levins wrote a letter to the Supreme Court saying, enter an order saying that now trials need to be done with six people. Uh, and I'm asking the committee the same thing. If a statute can be passed that says six, then we will have a vehicle to move forward. Uh, there are uh, some on the defense side that suggest that there's constitutional issues with, with a six person jury in a civil case. Um, 
the Vermont Constitution does not require 12. It does not state that 12 are required. There are cases from Civil War era, 1860s and around, that say at common law, a jury in Vermont was made up of 12 men. Well, we have unprecedented times. We have uh, an issue of safety. Uh, we have an issue of a backlog that's going to have legs, as people have talked about for years. And so that all, the, the 12 men idea needs to be revisited. And the Supreme Court has the power to do that. The legislature has the power to do that. Uh, and uh, we strongly urge that action be taken now. Uh, and for perspective, six person juries are not unheard of. They've been happening in Vermont in federal court and civil cases since 1973. I've tried those cases in federal court. I've talked to judges in federal court. They don't have a problem with six person juries. Uh, I think there are about 13 states that have six person juries in civil cases. So uh, it, it would not be you know, moving heaven and earth to, to make that shift. The conventional thought on the defense side is that they would prefer 12. And I'm not speaking for the defense bar. There are some attorneys who have agreed to six, as far as I understand. I haven't had that experience. In my cases, I've asked, let's do, let's agree to six. And the answer has been Liberty Mutual says no. And they can't, they have the power to say no. And we can file motions with the court to see if the judges will uh, grant that uh, and, and force the parties to have six. But that's what we're at. That's what the ask is today for this committee is um, get the discussion going about passing a statute or uh, the Supreme Court uh, entering an order. Uh, Senator Ruth, yes. Well, no, actually, I, I do. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm taking your role. But I, I, I do have a, uh, I do have a question before. Sure. I have a question for Eric, actually, who's online. Um, and I, my recollection is we did that bill a few years ago. I don't know where it went, but I thought we introduced a bill on smaller number of jurors. Maybe it was eight and not six. But my recollection is we, we had testimony on that a few years ago. Um, I think that's right. And I also think there's, there's a significant question raised about the constitutionality under the Vermont Constitution. There's a couple of older cases, uh, early 20th century cases in Vermont that specifically say that the jury right trial in the Vermont Constitution is for a 12 person jury. So I think, I think there's concern about uh, whether or not that's permissible. You could try it certainly, and and let that. As I say, th those are older cases, so maybe maybe a resolution would be different today. That's certainly possible, um, but I think that came up as a, a significant concern. Can you can you uh, have somebody research to see where that bill? I I do remember dealing with it. Um, yeah, yeah, and I have those cases. I actually looked at this issue just a few weeks ago for a. a in a different context, so I can send those along too. I, I think I might have introduced them. Senator Sears, there was yeah. also, I've been before, uh, and then maybe this is what you're thinking of, that there was a push uh, and committee looked at it, including judges and thought it was okay and it, and it never was passed, but for non-unanimous juries. Yes. That was something that I talked oh, to. okay, about. thank you, yep. So right. I don't know about six, but we did we did discuss non-unanimous and that, that did not, we still need 12 uh, unanimous in Vermont. That statute was never passed. I don't mind having hearings on the issue. I think it's certainly related to COVID. Uh, Senator Baruch, you had a question. Um, and, and maybe part of it's been answered now, but I, I was thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, if we pass a statute, it can still be immediately challenged. Then it has to go through the entire process, which takes us nowhere. So it seems like um, an order entered by the Supreme Court is the only thing that would really reliably speak to the problem in terms of time. Am I correct in that? Uh, can I answer that? Yeah, please. Um, it, it would be challenged, but right away is, I don't know if that it could be described that way. I think what would have to happen would there, there'd have to be a judge who had a trial that went uh, all the way through 
uh, with the mm -hmm. six person jury and then the constitutionality of that would have to be questioned. There'd have to be some ripe issue. It couldn't be but, just as soon as the statute passed, someone says, we don't. But if I'm, if I'm the defense bar and we've opposed six member juries and a judge and panels a six member jury, couldn't I ask the Supreme Court for a stay? Yeah, maybe an interlocutory appeal. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I agree. That's why we wrote the letter to the Supreme Court saying, um, basically, in essence, uh, if you're trying to weigh constitutional infringements, uh, we have no trials now. And if you're demanding 12, we're going to have no trials for a long time to come. So is that a greater infringement on the Vermont Constitution to have no trials at all or to have trials of six? That's the, that's the question I'd like the committee to consider. And I think the Supreme Court should consider uh, because I think not to steal... Um, Judge Grierson's thunder, but what I expect he's going to say is that the studies he has so far say the courts aren't safe for six. I mean, aren't safe for 12. I'm sorry, the ventilation. So the only way we're going to do them when we do open up are to have six. And then my, my last question is, um, it sounds from your testimony as though there's been a, an ongoing back and forth between the defense and plaintiff bars uh, to a certain extent to the extent that you know what each other's numbers are, um, have have uh, you explored the obvious middle ground? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm open-minded to all thoughts, but I guess what I'd leave this committee with is the idea that the bar can work this out on our own without an order from the Supreme Court, or without a statute. I just don't think is going to happen. Um, you know, I've. I never say never. I've, I've talked about Zoom jury draws. I'm open to that. I'm open to hybrid trials. I'm open to Senator Benning's thing, uh, thinking. Anything that can get the wheels going again, we have to keep an open mind about. These are not conventional times. So if we're talking about cases from 1860, um, they're not going to work anymore. Pat Gable has a comment or question, and then Senator White. I think I see your hand up, Pat, and that's why I'm calling on you. Oh, no, I didn't Even have my hand up. Even though you're scheduled to it, testify. Oh, right, I'm, I, I'm happy to wait till my turn comes. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. There's a hand. That was my hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Senator White. <laughs> well, I just, Eric, are you going to give us the um, um, case that decided that it was unconstitutional to have less than 12 because i can't find that anywhere in the constitution at all it does say unanimous but it doesn't say no, anything it does about the, the constitution i've got there there's a couple of different cases that held it very clear i think we got the the cart before the horse here with all i okay i'll send you the cases okay thank yeah. you uh the only other statutory fix i could think of uh, would be, uh, Greg mentioned this interest rate. That's only on hard economic damages. I've never really thought that that was much leverage on our side of the table. So that means there's interest that runs on um, medical bills and lost wages, but for pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, which are the larger claims, there's no prejudgment interest on those. And when I practiced in Massachusetts, when I first started, there there is a statute that has 12% on all damages. And that does have some incentive to push a case forward. And, and Greg was mentioning that the uh, defense are not, uh, are having to deal with the interest for no fault of their own. There's nothing preventing the defense from settling the case for fair value now or right away or at any time during the case. Um, so it, it's not quite, quite that simple, but um, we're open-minded to, to changes um, and, and ways to have jury trials. And we'd like to consider that discussion. And there was some mention about the COVID relief money. Obviously, there's going to be a need for resources. If we have challenges with technology for those in the Northeast Kingdom or elsewhere, uh, I, I, it sounds like money is going to be a, uh, a way to have to deal with some of that. Um, this is not a problem that I want everyone to think of as an emergency problem that is going to be removed with the vaccine, that we're just dealing with a backlog for a couple months and then we're gonna be okay. Uh, I think of this as a problem that has legs 
for years and that our fixes should be ones that we consider to be ones that are going to be permanent and help the system go forward. Thanks. You. Um, next, Pat Gable, or are there any other questions for Chris? Pat or Judge Gerson, whoever wants to go first or yeah, I'll, I'll start. Uh, Judge Gerson and I spoke, and then I'll turn it over uh, to him. Um, and um, this is obviously, good morning, everybody. It's a very, very important discussion. Um, and uh, we've spoken about a couple of issues in the committee this morning. Uh, Senator Sears, you opened with a very important question, which is what is it that the legislature can do uh, to provide relief, which I will uh, make a recommendation on that in a minute. Also, there were comments about well-being of lawyers and uh, the Supreme Court, uh, which uh, has as part of its constitutional responsibility, the regulation of lawyers is deeply concerned about uh, the well-being of lawyers, not only for themselves and to make sure that the people who appear in court uh, are well and healthy and able to uh, represent their clients, but also on behalf of clients. And so that's another issue that the court is paying attention to. And then um, ultimately some of these issues which really do cross constitutional boundaries. And so in answer to the question what the legislature can do, the best, most important, most direct and most constitutional thing the legislature could do with, would be to actually appropriate funds to the judiciary for additional permanent positions in the judiciary that would address the under-resourcing that um, we've experienced for many years. Uh, as um, some of your committee members know, particularly those who might sit on government operations, the judiciary is very nimble and has ingenuity. And we've found different ways to deal with the issues of insufficient human resources to deal with our needs. But in the, in the wake of the pandemic, and not just during the pandemic, but as Attorney Maley said, for the long aftermath of the pandemic, um, it's human resources. That's who we are. We don't own buildings. <laughs> we, we have people and they know how to either hear cases or support the people who hear cases. And so of all the constitutional responsibilities that have been talked about today in the, um, in the committee meeting, uh, that is so clearly a legislative uh, competence and a legislative power, which is the power of appropriation. Uh, and uh, I, you know, in another uh, format or maybe in another committee that, or at another time, I can go into that in more detail, but that is by far the, uh, the clearest, purest thing the legislature could do. Um, on a second issue, and that is on um, what is the role of the court? What is the role of the legislature? Um, it would be helpful just very briefly for me to identify what's happened since March 13, when the um, Supreme Court declared a judicial emergency as a result of the pandemic. And as a result of that, uh, the Supreme Court and I and Judge Grierson have met some in the beginning multiple times a week. It was daily uh, for many months. Uh, and now we're meeting at least uh, once or twice a week, it, focusing in on all the issues that you've been talking about this morning. And that includes the balance of interests between um, the need to provide public health and safety precautions uh, to those who by no choice uh, have to come and use our court systems. And at the same time, to make sure that the constitutional rights of Vermonters continue to be served. The court has never been fully clo uh, closed throughout the pandemic. And uh, we continue to use the uh, COVID-19 funds uh, to provide technological support and so, for example, although Attorney Maley was saying there have been no trials, uh, that's not uh, true. We, there have been no jury trials. There have been, we've continued to hold hearings in cases uh, using uh, technology. 
And it's the, the combination of the technology and many people in the judiciary working 24 seven and many more non uh, permanent positions in the judiciary, partly through limited service positions provided by COVID-19 funds, partly through the use of uh, temporary employees and with great gratitude, the many retired um, employees who've come back to work as temporary employees in the judiciary, both judges and uh, managers and staff in order to help us make it through. And so um, uh, I, I think it's important to realize that while the legislature has a broad um, concern, and in your case, in your committee for the criminal justice system, the Supreme Court and Judge Gerson and I and the teams that, with whom we work focus 100% of our time on the issues discussed today. And that, that has a meaning under our constitution because with three equal branches of government, um, the Supreme Court sits um, and has the same position in the judicial branch as the governor has in the executive branch and as the speaker and pro tem have in the legislature. And so the administration of the Supreme Court, including this balancing of interest, is, is clearly within the constitutional responsibility and duty of the court. We work, as you know, in collaboration with the other branches. And the best way we work together is when we are cooperating together and doing problem solving together. And we welcome uh, the opportunity with this committee uh, to do that kind of problem solving. Uh, I think in a minute when Judge Grierson um, starts to speak, you'll hear that we're already under consideration um, in the judiciary. And uh, for, I know this committee knows, but for those Vermonters who might be watching today, when the Supreme Court issued um, an, an order declaring the judicial emergency back in March, um, we continued uh, and the Supreme Court continued to amend that order as public health evidence um, presented itself. And as we had some experience in the judiciary working within the confines of the threats of the pandemic. And as a result of that, the Supreme Court has found ways to amend that order and to adopt other rules that allow as much opening as possible. <clears throat> uh, Judge Grierson will speak in a minute about um, the trial that we had scheduled in Wyndham that, will, um, that was postponed as the statistics rose, but um, will uh, surely be scheduled again. And so the combination <clears throat> of first looking at criminal juries and the constitutional rights that are there is one consideration. Uh, we have had discussions and there'll be a meeting later today of the, um, the committee, which is not just of the judiciary, but of counsel and others, looking at the potential restart of civil uh, jury trials as well. And so one thing I would ask the committee is to recognize that the discussions we're having this morning are taking place on a daily basis uh, in the judiciary. Uh, so I'll, um, I'll conclude because I'd like Judge Gerson to have enough time to talk about the nuts and bolts of what we've been doing together, uh, but we share all the concerns of the committee and um, uh, I speak on behalf of the Supreme Court to say that uh, they are on a daily basis constantly uh, reviewing, looking at all the ways we can open access to justice and still protect the health of Vermonters. Thank you. Judge Grierson, unless okay. there's any questions for Pat Gable. Judge Grierson. Thank you, Senator Sears, and thank the committee for inviting us to appear and speak on this issue, which obviously is interest not only to the, this committee, but to the other witnesses and, and the um, and, and all of the folks in Vermont who rely on the courts to uh, remedy the, the issues that are presented to us. I, I would just, uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge, just ask the committee to uh, recall my testimony uh, last week when the question before the committee was, um, 
criminal jury trials, why haven't there been any? And I'll just remind um, Senator, uh, the committee, but Senator Sears mentioned it. In the Wyndham Courthouse, we were talking about using literally three full-size courtrooms to conduct, it could have been one a one-day trial. In other words, that's just the, I think the best example of the task that is before us to try to conduct trials, jury trials, whether it's criminal or civil. The same issues that have impacted and limited our ability to conduct criminal jury trials apply to civil trials, uh, civil jury trials. And the real, the, the overarching issue that we all know is the ebb and flow uh, of this pandemic. I think it's fair to say that when this started uh, almost a year ago, people were thinking, okay, we'll be in this for a few weeks, maybe a couple months, uh, and then by fall, we'll be back in business. And, and that obviously has not been the case. Um, the Wyndham Courthouse, uh, we thought was our best opportunity to have a trial. Uh, the, the, you, if you go back to AO 49, uh, you will see that the, the Supreme Court gave a priority to criminal cases and juvenile cases, criminal cases because of that detained population. And so our focus uh, up until now has been on uh, trying to restart criminal jury trials. The idea behind Wyndham um, was due in part, we thought that was our best uh, opportunity to, to do a trial. Um, but it was really, we needed to have one trial to understand what it means to conduct a trial, whether it's criminal or civil, in this pandemic world. Um, Senator Baruth uh, talked about the impact of vaccines. And what I'm hearing, what I'm reading about the impact of vaccines, um, it, it should not be viewed as a panacea to the problems that we're, we're here talking about. Because as he mentioned, and my understanding is the same, is that that vaccine will protect me, um, but it won't protect, there's not enough data to determine whether even if I have the vaccine and I'm immune, that I cannot transmit the virus to the person next to me. So what I'm hearing is that even with the vaccine, until there's a large, large, large uh, number in the population having this vaccine, that we're gonna continue to have to maintain masking and social distancing for some period of time, even if, even if we have the vaccine. What that means is that the, this is not going to be a short-term solution. It, it's something that's going to continue. So even with the vaccine, we have to look at what do we have for resources? How can we use those? I, I said a minute ago that the issues that relate to the, to the civil uh, trials are the same issues a lot of the same issues that relate to conducting a criminal jury trial. But there are some differences and that's obviously why this committee is here today. So I just wanna highlight those, those differences. Um, one of the other witnesses, uh, I think Mr. Weimer indicated that we have been conducting um, evaluations um, for airflow, air circulation within the courthouses because that is key to being able to uh, bring in members of the public uh, for these proceedings in, in a safe, safe manner. Um, there are differences, um, and I think I mentioned it last week, and I'll just remind the committee, if we're talking about the state courthouses, the Bennington Courthouse, the, the uh, White River Courthouse, uh, Brattleboro, are all state-owned buildings. BGS um, has control over the facilities. And they're the ones that we're relying on to provide us the information we need in order to assess the, uh, the appropriateness of those courthouses for conducting trials. But civil trials, for the most part, um, except in single jurisdictions like Orange or Lamoille, uh, Addison, for instance, um, most of the civil trials are conducted in the co county courthouses. Uh, they present uh, different issues uh, number one, uh, we've retained the services of an engineering firm to conduct the studies there. And we have received studies on those county courthouses that have either a, a full HVAC system or at least a semblance of, a, of an HVAC system, a circulate air circulation system. 
Um, and with those reports, uh, for instance, I know we have them from Orange, uh, Windsor County Courthouse, uh, Chittenden, and perhaps one or two others. But the common thread in all of those evaluations at this point is that they are saying that we can only conduct juries with six to eight people, meaning a six person jury with two alternates. That obviously limits uh, the ability to conduct trials uh, as, as, as Chris has indicated, as well as, as other witnesses. Um, so even if those courthouses are deemed uh, appropriate to conduct trials, um, that right now, uh, unless I get clarification on any of these, we're looking at limiting civil cases to six person juries. Um, from the judiciary's perspective, we're not in the business of choosing between uh, plaintiffs and defense one side or the other. But I think it's clear that at this point, uh, if we're going to be able to conduct civil trials in the county courthouses, um, we need a remedy to the fact that right now there are 12 person uh, juries. And there's only one way of getting that or two ways either by agreement um, of the parties to submit to a six person jury, or is there some action legislative or through the Supreme Court uh, that can try to address that, that issue. Um, and I'll certainly look forward to the research that Eric has done um, or will be doing to look at that issue from a statutory perspective. Um, so th that's, this, that's one of the big stumbling blocks right now with, with uh, the inability to conduct civil juries. Um, I agree with Chris and, and with Senator Benning, uh, the threat, if you will, of jury trials, whether it's in a criminal context or a civil context, is what drives resolutions. We've seen that just in the, the Wyndham court when we uh, picked 10 or 12 cases that we thought might be appropriate for criminal trials. Um, and some of those cases settled just because we started talking about jury trial. We're hoping, just to bring the committee up to date, we're still looking at late February, more likely into March to resume in Wyndham. Um, and we're looking at other courts, hopefully coming online after that, um, but with some of the same limitations. Each courthouse uh, and unit has to present a plan uh, to my office and, and Terry Scott's court of uh, trial court operations and Pat uh, of how they're going to bring a jury in, how they're going to circulate throughout the, the day within the courthouse. Um, I mean, that's clearly what the issue is from a civil standpoint. I, I will tell this committee that uh, later this afternoon, uh, the Supreme Court uh, jury restart committee that formulated the plan as it related to the criminal dockets is reconvening to discuss this, this issue of how do we get uh, civil jury trials uh, started again. A lot of the work that was done in relation to criminal jury trials certainly will apply um, to starting up uh, civil jury trials, uh, but there are some other issues that need to be addressed. And, and I hope that one of the recommendations that I will bring to that committee is the possibility of a rule through the court uh, for a six person jury. Um, but I, that, that's, what it's, that's what I think is going to take to move uh, civil trials. Um, and, and that's that's the problem we're all all confronting. I will say this. Someone mentioned remote trials and remote voir dire. Um, I have already put together a committee of judges, trial judges, to look at this issue of, uh, we began with the issue of remote voir dire. Um, just by way of example, uh, we also mentioned, and Senator Benning mentioned, the limitations on cell service, internet service in, in places in Vermont. And that's one of the reasons, for instance, in the Wyndham trial, as we were moving forward, uh, pretty early on, we dismissed the idea of a, a remote voir dire, remote jury selection, because there are pockets in Wyndham County that don't have cell service. 
Having said that, this group of uh, trial judges that, that I've put together will continue to look at that issue. Um, and I think even in approaching that, we have to recognize, number one, we can't exclude jurors because they don't have adequate cell service or internet service. So even if we're looking at remote voir dire, we have to look at it as some people may be able to engage in that means, but we have to leave open the option uh, for people to still come to the courthouse for that purpose. So I view it as, as a hybrid. The reason I think remote voir dire is important is as we're looking at what we can do to remedy this, I think we need to look at solutions that will outlive, uh, outlast the pandemic circumstances. If there's any uh, uh, silver lining to this pandemic from the judiciary's perspective, it is the increased ability to conduct hearings uh, remotely. Uh, now we've all we've been forced into doing it at this point, but there are many aspects of remote hearings that I expect will continue once the pandemic lifts. In order to to for us to learn more about what it really means to conduct a trial. Uh, remotely or virtually. Um, we heard of uh, a number of trials taking place out in the state of Washington that were exclusively Zoom uh, trials, virtual trials. And so uh, we invited uh, a couple of judges uh, from uh, Seattle era to come uh, in a meeting, obviously a Zoom meeting, but we had one uh, just this week with the trial judges to understand what they did and how they did it. They have shared a lot of the materials that they have used to be able to do that. So even though it would appear on the surface that we have not been able uh, to move ahead and, and that's true to some extent, we are looking at ways that we, we can move ahead. I don't know how realistic it is at this point to say we could conduct a trial exclusively remotely, but I believe there are aspects of it and principally uh, the voir dire interests me because that's the largest number of people that are involved in the, in, in the jury trial process at the beginning. So if we can use a means, uh, a remote means to uh, reduce the number of people coming in to a courtroom and we get down to whether it's six or 12 in a criminal case, that has been a substantial, would be a substantial improvement. So uh, remote voir dire appeals to me because I think it's something we can continue to use. And that's exactly what the judges from Washington were telling us earlier this week. They, their experience has been, even when this is over, they would want to continue that. They've seen it. So there are parts of this, uh, as difficult as it is, that um, we continue to explore those options. Um, and, and we're going to hopefully put together uh, a pilot, if you will, of, of remote voir dire. Um, at least that's that's the discussion that is going on now within uh, within the trial uh, trial bench uh, to see is that realistic. Um, that's all, that's all I've got <laughs> at this point. Judge, I appreciate both you and you and Pat testimony as well as Chris, uh, Senator Baruth. Uh, thank you, Judge. I'm, I'm wondering, um, to go back to what Mr. Maley was uh, saying, he was saying that the plaintiff bar and the, and the defense bar would not by themselves be able to work this out. And so he threw out two possibilities, one a statutory fix and the other an order registered um, by the Vermont Supreme Court. What, what would your thoughts just specifically be on the efficacy of any statutory fix that we might do as opposed to, um, is it your sense that it should be left to the courts to work out? Well, again, I guess I'd, I'd like to, you know, see the research, do the research on the issue of the statutory framework. If, if you, I think it, uh, Chris and others commented that if you passed a statute to affect this and made it effective on passage, as you sometimes choose to do, uh, it would be challenged through the court process. 
Um, and it may very well be that if the Supreme Court decides to enact a rule and maybe an emergency rule uh, to apply only during a, you know, a, a limited time period, that that same challenge would come into play. So I, I don't know whether one, in that sense, one is preferable over the other. Um, but I, that's what I hope to explore with the, with the uh, court's restart committee is the, the, the possibility of, of doing that. But would it, um, would it be theoretically faster in terms of the elapsed time that we would have to endure the challenge if the Vermont Supreme Court uh, produced an emergency order? The, the challenge for that, am I right, would be shorter in duration possibly than a statutory challenge yes. that would have, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, the, the, but the very nature of an emergency rule is, is, is that, and yeah. how long it lasts is always uh, an issue. Because I, I find myself, um, when, I, when I try to think about us stepping into this, it seems as though what we might uh, inadvertently do is lengthen the amount of time that nothing happens. Um, so that's, that's one worst case scenario. Yeah, I, whatever, whether it's through legislature or even if the Supreme Court was so inclined and, and obviously I, don't, I do not speak for them, it, I would expect it would be challenged. Um, you know, I, it, 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 I will tell the committee that uh, there's at least two um, different um, groups that I meet with periodically from uh, other, other New England states um, to discuss this same issue. And um, not, that it, not that that's the benchmark, but all the New England states are struggling, struggling uh, with this mm -hmm. issue. Um, the meeting this week, uh, Rhode Island hasn't had any trials. Um, I believe, I'm not sure about Connecticut, Massachusetts may have had a few six person trials, Maine is on hold. The, the rise in the numbers in New England since uh, beginning in November uh, have continued and that has for the most part brought any trials that were going on uh, to a halt in January and people are looking at, is it safe to start up again in February? Um, it's more likely March I think is what people are looking at and, and that's why I was referring earlier to hoping to restart uh, Wyndham. Uh, the only other thing that occurred to me as I was listening, uh, Senator Sears mentioned the idea of starting up, you know, why not take the Barry Auditorium, which I'm intimately familiar with, um, as a point, as a place to do trials. So, again, I go back to the idea of in, in a year where resources um, are, are probably going to be limited for whatever the legislature wants to do, separate and apart from uh, the problem that we're before you with today. If you stand up uh, the Barry Auditorium for trials, then you've got to ask yourself, how many other places can we do that within the state? Um, and if we stood up uh, the Barry Auditorium, who's going to get trials there? Um, is it going to be criminal trials, civil trials? How do we weigh th a case out of Wyndham County or Bennington County or Rutland County? Are they the ones that get selected uh, to come to Barry for that trial? But more importantly, I, I'm hopefully looking forward to the, the vaccines certainly making a difference in, in what we feel is a safe uh, arena to bring people into. It may take longer than, than some of us think, but outfitting a building like the Barry Auditorium for trials at best is temporary. And the question is, um, is it, does that kind of investment at this point in time uh, make sense as opposed to hopefully opening up these courthouses and, and putting in the improvements, airflow, circulation, uh, to get the buildings that are at least designed already for courthouses. Even if we have to use three courtrooms, we know within those buildings where the jurors have to go and what the jurors need. So. Um, I'm not opposed to that idea, Senator Sears. It's just, 
it's 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 a completely different investment of resources um, that that we would have have to think about. Um, so. Resources are always an issue. Uh, Matt uh, brought it up, and I don't disagree with her. Um, you know, sitting on the appropriations committee. Um, <clears throat> And uh, seeing how different interests vary and constantly trying to figure out what is the priority. Um, and having, you know, you're giving the, leg I think you give the legislature a little too much credit for having access to the resources because frankly, the administration is the one with the access when, when they come back with a, with a 0% increase in the judiciary um, and the house does a 0% increase and you try to do a four to 8% increase in the Senate, it, it hardly makes a dent and I am aware of that, but our, our problem is we're, we're competing and um, with different interests. And so um, we may never be able to um, get where you want to get, but I, within reason, I'm happy to look at any proposals to um, improve both post-pandemic and pandemic um, access to justice of uh, monitors. So uh, whether it be criminal or civil, um, and you know, I've, I've asked the question and can't get the auditor to do an audit of, you know, <laughs> What happened to the transport deputies when we stopped doing transports? Well, it, it, I mean, that was just a minor resource issue to me. What happened? Um, you know. So it's an. I'll comment this way. Senator. I mean, that's just a. That's just one. We know. We know you're doing it remotely, by and but, large. But let me just take a minute to tell you. One of the projects we're working on is with that very issue, because of, of the location of our facilities are somewhat isolated from where the people were bringing them. Uh, in other words, uh, some of you may know that the Marble Valley uh, has been closed, at least for the yeah. detainee population. So right. anyone who rests- Springfield. Exactly. So Springfield is now the hub. And so DOC, um, is involved in transportation, but more recently uh, to address the issue of transporting people from Springfield, we have engaged uh, the, the um, sheriff in Wyndham County to provide transport um, from the facility back to the Brattleboro Courthouse. So it's almost the reverse of what they were doing. And we're trying, we're just barely getting that project off the ground. And if it's successful, then we may reach out to other uh, sheriffs uh, to see if that would work in other areas because of the location of the facilities. Um, so I, I'm, it's a question and, and, and uh, I just wanted the committee to be aware that that's something we're working on to take advantage of, of that resource. And, and it might be helpful to clarify that the transport uh, deputies are not part of the judiciary budget. Yeah. Right. At this time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Senator Benning. Judge, I agree with you. There's no panacea here. Um, I have a question first and then a comment. Is there a general rule on jury draw day? How many cases are placed on the calendar? What is there a maximum of some kind that judges generally understand? You know, what I found over my time on the bench and more so since I've been in this position and traveling around to different counties, it's almost a cultural, uh, it, it varies. Um, for whatever reason, uh, Franklin County, by way of example, on their jury draw day, criminal uh, draws, they would routinely have over a hundred cases on that list. Uh, whereas, uh, in other counties, it's a more reasonable list. You might come in with 
uh, 10 or 15 uh, criminal cases on a jury list. Um, so it varies and it's, it's that, that's all I can tell you. Uh, the civil trials are usually a, a much smaller number, but uh, it wouldn't be uncommon to, to um, have six to 10 civil cases on a, a list. Um, whether you want to call it jury draw or the, the final pretrial, but um, it, it varies from county to county and docket. So there's no gen, no general rule from no. your office that says X number is no. the max. So that brings up um, the overall question for me. It's useless to get more personnel into a system that cannot function while those personnel can't be in buildings that don't have proper HVAC unless and until those people are actually immune. And this avalanche that's coming, if we are going to not have available some magical paintbrush that takes care of it all at the same time, has got to start being chipped away before it all comes at us at one time. And so I'm coming back to the idea that the more people we can get vaccinated, we have to start piecemeal at chipping away this avalanche. So getting court personnel immunized needs to be, in my eyes, at the top of the priority list for this branch of government to start getting back to functioning normally. If there is a first wave that has people 65 and older, the idea of having those people brought into a place where the court personnel are already vaccinated, that's another step in the right direction. Having uh, the obstacle of buildings that are not HVAC proper is then eliminated. Uh, that no longer becomes a hurdle to moving something and decreasing the size of the avalanche down the road. And as more people come into uh, that wave, the second wave, in other words, you're increasing the size of a potential jury pool. And I understand there would be requirements to waive uh, that have to be addressed. The issue of, is this a jury of my peers? but you have to start this conversation somewhere. If you have clients that are coming into the building that have not been immunized, while I agree that's a problem that we have to deal with, it is a much easier thing to do to isolate them in the building, uh, much the way they are currently today. If I walked into Caledonia's courthouse, there is now plastic that uh, isolates me when I'm sitting at the defense counsel table. But that is not as uh, threatening to the court system functioning as not doing anything at all and waiting for this avalanche to hit us. So I, I guess my comment is simply to say, we all have to be united in convincing the administration uh, in getting this system to move in some fashion again, that the court system has to be on the top of the priority list in getting vaccines. Uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm just looking for some way to get this avalanche. It's coming whether we like it or not, but the size of it can be decreased if we use piecemeal operations to combat it. Joe. Um, yes, sir. An another thing occurs to me about this. We, we talked about on one end, there might be dissatisfaction or a challenge because it wasn't a jury of one's peers. I think on the other end, if I'm 75 and over and I get vaccinated and then I find out that I've essentially agreed to be in a very small pool for jury draw, as opposed to what I'm normally in as a citizen, I think you might have problems there too because older Vermonters would say, 
even though I'm vaccinated, I don't want to go into a congregate setting because I'm 75. Um, so I want to be vaccinated and go back to my house and not encounter a large group of people. Your idea, I think, now that I think about it, would greatly increase any 70-year-old Vermonter's chances of being forced by law into a voir dire situation. Um, Philip, I, I made the yeah. mistake of saying 75. It's actually 65 and over well, is the first way. But let me, let me say, when you get a notice for jury draw yeah. as, as a prospective juror, you are able to make an argument if you feel you really can't participate in the process for whatever reason. And the judge gets to make a decision about whether your reason is valid or not. There are all kinds of potential hurdles that may make an argument that somebody puts out and they come up and be valid and the judge says, all right, I'm going to exclude you. But you still have a pool out there that we can start to use to provide leverage against this backlog of cases. No, I, I, and I am, both I do civil understand. and criminal are the same thing. To get this backlog taken care of, you've got to have leverage from someplace. No, I understand that, but but in essence, I think you could unintentionally disincentivize older Vermonters who hear that if they get the vaccine, they're now going to be part of a very small pool for jury trials. Um, so I I, th I think there's problems with any any solution. You've brought forward a potential solution. I think it should be discussed, absolutely. Um, and I think I heard Judge Grierson say that all of these ideas will go in the hopper. But I, I, I'm, I, I'm just saying there are unintentional consequences to designating a small slice of Vermonters as the only people who will be considered for jury trials. I, I don't disagree that there will be hurdles. I am primarily saying we have to get the court personnel on the top of the priority yeah. list. And that is a place to start the conversation. I agree. And as those waves <clears throat> come in succession, you increase the number of people available. That will eventually bring us to where we want to be. But just getting a pool of any kind together will provide some leverage to begin settling cases. And that's the whole idea is to start someplace. That doesn't cost us any money, by the way. The legislature doesn't have a, a cost associated with that. This is when we get the vaccines, they're available. We have to decide who it is that's getting them first. I'm suggesting our first attempt should be, let's convince the administration that the court personnel and anybody associated with the court system on a regular basis should be at the top of the priority list. And we get that system beginning to move again. Fair enough. Eric. The Senator Sears, I wasn't sure if you wanted to wait on this or did you want to hear for a minute on a, a moment on the 12 person jury issue? Yes. Well, it's, it's uh, I'll just read this, uh, the language from, from one of the cases. And uh, I think as Mr. Maley indicated earlier, he, he was indicating the year 1869, that could have been a random excellent coincidence or it could have been, he, he's perfectly aware of this particular case. But uh, I'll just read the language because it's, it's so on point. Uh, and it's, it's the language that in the constitution that the court is referring to is in chapter one, article 12, where the Constitution says the parties have a right to trial by jury. And if you look at the, this case, uh, the language says that, uh, uh, hang on just a second, I had it here. The word jury as used in the Constitution means a common law jury of 12 men, obviously gender neutral today, but at the time it used the word men. Uh, the Constitution does not require the legislature to provide for trials of issues or causes by jury, but the constitution does require that the legislature shall either provide for a jury of 12 men for the trial of all causes before all courts which have jurisdiction 
of any matter or cause in which the issue is proper for the cognizance of a jury, or uh, allow the cause to be carried by appeal to a court in which that mode of trial is provided for. So it's quite clear, but it's also quite old. You know, that's an 1869 case. And again, in 1917, uh, in a different case, the court said, the jury referred to in these provisions is the common law jury of 12. So uh, it's clear, but it's also two, two points leap to mind, I think. One, because uh, there are such older cases, it's perfectly legitimate for the legislature to try and pass a statute and, and uh, go with a different number and just you know, allow the court to reconsider that position because it's been a long time. That's not unusual. Uh, it's also, one might say, particularly since the court is referring particularly to legislative authority there, and it kind of goes back to uh, Pat Gable's comments earlier, you know, it might be a situation where given the, the emergency authority that the court has issued Administrative Order 47 under, you, know, you, know, you could sort of see the court saying, pursuant to that order and pursuant to its own inherent emergency authority, given the current circumstances of COVID, Yes, we recognize that, that those decisions are out there 100 years ago, but in light of this emergency situation, by rule, they might provide for a, a, a jury of fewer than 12 people, at least during the pendency of the emergency. That sort of seems also like a reasonable position that could be taken. Um, so anyway, that's what I had. I thought it might be helpful for the committee to hear that now since we were talking about the issue. Uh, so Thank you. Um, why don't, in the interest of moving along, um, what if we did, would it amend, I'm sorry, Terry wanted to make a comment and I missed that. Go ahead, Terry. Oh, no, and I apologize. I, I, I was thinking everybody was done and I just wanted to make a brief comment at the end. Um, I had invited Greg Weimer as chair of the Practice and Procedure Committee, which is the civil docket committee, um, assuming that you all would prefer hearing from a practitioner. Uh, but I, I did want to just indicate on behalf of the bar, I can state that the bar would definitely give its full support to whatever measures um, are implemented to move things along, whether it's Senator Benning's encouragement that court personnel be moved to the top of the vaccination list, the remote video, the remote um, voir dires, whatever uh, is decided upon the, the bar, uh, is, it, it, you have the bar's full support. The judiciary has been very good about involving the bar in the AO49 developments. We went from weekly to monthly calls with, with Pat, uh, Pat and Judge Grierson and the chief, and we have bar representatives on the jury restart committee. So we, we want to support whatever will move things along. One thing that hadn't been mentioned in particular with regard to the civil docket that I just wanted to briefly mention, with the moratorium on the landlord tenant and foreclosure cases for all of these months, when that moratorium ends, that's going to, I think, open up a floodgate. And in order to have civil jury trials while the civil division judge is dealing with the, this incredible backlog in the civil docket, one possibility might be retired judges for civil jury trials um, separately, which does involve the costs, which leads to Pat's point. The bar also would fully support whatever funding uh, requests were made to, to again, move the dockets along so that all of these Vermonters who are in limbo with their civil cases will have a chance for things to start progressing. So there would be that support as well. Lastly, in terms of the six person jury versus 12 person, as Chris and Greg have mentioned, there are competing interests, but the bar would definitely support a decision that's made <laughs> so that people can know when they talk with their clients, here's the timeline, here's what the situation is. That's another area where there's been a tremendous amount of limbo in the civil docket and, and Vermonters are um, suffering as a result. So those are just brief points I wanted to make where the bar can offer <laughs> a consensus and support. And um, again, whatever we can do to, to help in this effort, um, we're at your service. Well, I, I, uh, I appreciate that. So committee, um, you know, maybe it 
it's time for a little discussion. Um, I would have no objection to um, amending a judicial rule or a piece of legislation that um, would be temporary in nature during the pandemic that would establish a six person jury in civil trials. Um, which gives us a place to begin discussions. And I also have no objection to, and I hate to put you through a, an effort, Judge and Pat, of, but I have no objection to seeing what you think the resources would need to be in order to accomplish that. Okay. Yeah, Senator White. So um, I wouldn't have any objection to that either, but I think that um, given the conversation that Philip, uh, that Senator Baruth uh, brought up about the speediness of it, if we did it by legislation, it is going to be um, August before there's any, I, I mean, we have to pass something, then the house has to pass something, then it has to go to the government. It, it's going to be a long time. It seems to me that just a letter from the Supreme Court, and and I don't know if that has to be by rule or if it can just be part of an executive, a judicial executive order, given the the emergency situation. It seems to me that that is a speedier, that that would get it going much faster than legislation. Well, there is a thing called the budget adjustment. What? There's a thing called the Budget Adjustment Act. Oh, no, no. I, I meant in terms of allowing the six person. I didn't, I wasn't referring to the resources. I was referring to the fact that um, to allow a six person jury trial. Well, you could put the resources into the budget and put in language that the court shall promulgate rules or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so probably you've all experienced this as well, all the other senators. People will contact me and um, want me to unilaterally change something about how our pandemic response is going. And I always have to explain to them that the administrative branch, the governor, has most of the emergency power. And um, in this case, it seems to me if the, if the governor and the Supreme Court together issued emergency orders that were interlocking, you would probably forestall a lot of the opposition or the challenges. But if we go at it unilaterally as the legislature, you know, uh, controlled both houses by Democrats, um, I think we open ourselves up for a much more likely set of long running challenges. So um, I guess my, my own thinking about it again would be as opposed to us trying to cobble something together that falls apart, if the Supreme Court and the governor were convinced of the efficacy of a six person jury, then both of them speaking to that in their capacity with emergency power seems like the way to go. Yeah. Because even promulgating rules takes a long time. Yeah. Well, judicial rules. Chris? Um, I just add one thing on the Supreme Court order. I, it would be the Vermont Association for Justice preference that that happen as opposed to legislation for all the reasons that were described. And there is some historical perspective here. The Supreme Court had shut down trials before. It was before my time, but there was a moratorium on trials. There was a budgetary problem and the Supreme Court said, we're just not gonna have trials. And attorneys from my side of the bar brought an action, a petition to try to overrule that emergency order to say, Supreme Court, you can't do this. You're shutting down a constitutional right. And the Supreme Court showed that it has power. And it could say, we met what we said, uh, no trials. And the same thing here, if the Supreme Court says we can do this, the only remedy would be a petition. And you'd be asking the same people who just said we can do this to say, wait, there's this case from 1869. The Supreme Court can say, we just issued an emergency order. We say this is constitutional under these circumstances. So there's no question they have the power to do this. It's just whether that's what they're gonna to decide to do or not. 
And if I, I might just add, I think the likelihood that the court uh, will be considering this kind of action and act pretty quickly um, is high. And uh, so I don't know if that makes a difference to the committee, but uh, um, it, it's Good within much. the court's areas of expertise, as Attorney Maley points out. And I think uh, the court you know, has a, a similar view to the discussion today about uh, the urgency of um, moving these cases. Great. Senator Nitkin. Oh, uh, this afternoon, as I understand it, Judge Grierson is meeting with um, the Supreme Court panel, and maybe this discussion we're having here today could certainly maybe spur them forward to do something with regard to the six-person juries. This this panel, Senator, is um, the Supreme Court established a, a jury restart committee back in the, the spring, <clears throat> and it consists of some members of the Supreme Court. It also has representatives from the Vermont Bar Association. It has trial judges. Um, so it's it's a mix of people that make recommendations um, as a result of, of the pandemic and the impact of that on court operations. So they, this committee uh, of the Supreme Court makes recommendations to the Supreme Court. So uh, that it's that committee that's meeting this afternoon of which um, I'm on that committee, but so are other members of, of, of the bar and, and as I said, uh, trial judges. So yes. it, it, it'll, and I, I would almost uh, be sure that some members of that uh, committee are listening to this this session. Um, uh, so I want to kind of, uh, Senator Benning had a comment. Yeah, I, I agree that this measure will move us in the right direction, but it's absolutely useless if you don't have a jury pool available on the other side of the conversation. And so I'm hoping that the message that's being delivered um, from us to the judiciary is the judiciary needs to be behind contacting the administration and saying, in order for us to achieve this objective, we've got to start raising on the priority list the personnel who are necessary to achieve what we're trying to accomplish here for vaccination purposes. Well, I, the only, I'm not an expert on vaccination, but I think what I've heard here today is there's a concern that until a large majority of Vermonters and visitors are vaccinated, you're still gonna have the danger of the, of the pandemic. And, um, so I'm not sure how long this judicial emergency will last. <clears throat> the question is, is there a way to, for us to encourage the startup of six member, eight member uh, jury trials so that the civil backlog can start to get moved forward? And what would be the resources needed in order to do that in terms of technology, et cetera, and can they be part of the second, I'm gonna call it CARES Act, um, that, the, that the federal government just sent out and we're looking at the, the uh, resources or perhaps a third one that the, that the Biden administration has been talking about. But for my purposes, at least, um, I'm happy to look at the resources you feel you'd need in order to accomplish this. Senator Sears, the, um, uh, you hit on an important issue because the judiciary did get CARES Act funding and we have already spent or embargoed the funding that we received. And so we would be happy to uh, take a review of the pandemic related needs uh, in terms of uh, doing a, uh, a startup of uh, jury trials again and provide some information to you. And that is kind of a separate issue from, you know, the long, longer term issues regarding right. additional right. permanent positions, but we could uh, work on that and then provide the, the committee some information on that. That would be helpful. And in light of the budget adjustment that'll be coming out of the house in the next few weeks and being dealt with by the Senate appropriate 
might be a timely place, but there are also um, the internet resources and stuff that Senator Rennings spoke of and others, um, whatever that might be. Senator White. So I actually uh, support Joe's position here on um, trying to encourage the administration to, um, because if you have, and the, the vaccines don't, aren't going to um, eliminate the need for social distancing and masks and all that kind of stuff. But we need, if we're going to start up um, and figure out a way of starting up uh, jury trials, we need to make sure that we protect the court personnel that are working and that have to be there. And it, it's for their protection that they're vaccinated not necessarily for the protection of others, but I, I think that that's really important. And I know that each of us has heard from um, constituent groups that are advocating that they are be at the top of the list. But, um, <clears throat> and I understand the reasons that the administration is doing it the way they're doing it. But I do believe that if we are going to have a, a judicial system that works for the benefit of Vermonters and it gives them fair and speedy. Speedy is, um, I guess, kind of a, a not a very good term, but um, it's relative. But it, it does seem to me that we need to protect the court personnel, that we cannot, and, and I'm, I'm for one, I for one am um, happy to join Joe in trying to uh, convince the administration to put court, court personnel um, at the top of the list. For the, for the committee's information, I, I tried to testify about this a couple of weeks ago, but I didn't have good internet. Um, the Chief Justice and I did reach out uh, uh, to executive branch leadership, it seems like three or four weeks ago, and we were referred to the Department of Health and we are waiting uh, to be contacted by the Department of Health. Here's the, here's the problem that I see in us getting involved in that, frankly. And I don't necessarily disagree with Joe and Jeanette. But it's, so you have a situation where um, most people would like to get vaccinated and get ahead of the list of those over the way the, the state has rolled it out, plans to roll it out. I'm in New York State, they did a thing for teachers, but they forgot the child care personnel. So they're all upset. Why are teachers more important than us? And I think it's fraught with problems um, trying to get one group ahead of another group. So what about anybody who's a potential juror? Shouldn't they all be? Just, I just see that. I think I'm not sure we solved this problem until there's herd immunity. Until, and frankly, it's the federal government, hopefully, is, is going to um, get more vaccine to more Americans as soon as possible. And that's the way out of this, in my opinion. So I just think there's problems if we try to do that. What, what about the jail guards? What about the prisoners, which is one of the highest groups to in nationwide? Um, so I, I, you know, it's, it's various groups. I just, uh, I, if I could only chip in, Dick, if we're waiting for herd immunity, every other suggestion that's been presented here is just that. It's a suggestion that's not going to decrease the avalanche that we're eventually going to get hit with. And the jury pool right now could be assembled with people 65 and older once that cohort is vaccinated. So you've now begun to crack that really tall iceberg. Uh, and to me, it makes sense that the judicial staff necessary to assemble that cohort is also protected. It's a finite group of people. And that system in order to begin has to have comfort 
that the people who are in these buildings that we all know are not properly HVAC um, have to have themselves the protections that are necessary to begin to chip away at this. If we are waiting for a panacea like herd immunity, I agree with you, that would solve the entire problem. But if we're waiting for that, we are just increasing this problem in proportions we all don't have any ability to understand. I, I, my, my concern is how do you get somebody to the top of the list? I make make noise. Decision. Huh? I we just, make noise. We become the squeaky makes wheel. The decision. Yeah. I, would just, I would like to weigh in on that. I mean, teachers yeah. who are in the classroom every day, exposed to all kinds of kids from all kinds of families. I mean, they've been asking mm -hmm. all along. And even though they are younger and therefore not such a risk of dying, which is what the governor says is the prime thing is to keep people from dying. I mean, they still, it seems like everybody is desperate to get schools fully opened so that children can be in school, so people can go to work, et cetera. And I think, I don't, I don't see moving this group and, and nobody's saying teachers are in any kind of line either. But uh, Alice, I, I would only pu push back to that statement by saying, the governor right now is making decisions on who's on the priority list based on death rates. That's right. And I understand that logic, but this is a whole branch of government that is coming to a rapid standstill. <clears throat> and when that happens, it's got to be taken into account. It's not death rates that we're looking at. It's a whole branch of government that's not moving. And to me, that's a, a whole nother part of the conversation that has yet to be had. And it will require all of the people on this screen to be united in the belief that it's important enough for that branch of government to move forward, that the people who are involved in it get higher on that priority list. My wife is a teacher. I understand she has that need, but the chances of her running into a death situation are much lower than having a jury pool come in with all kinds of people from all kinds of age groups. If you don't get those people protected first, that's gonna be an element that's a problem by itself. But the overall concern here is one branch of government is literally coming to a, a standstill. And I appreciate the fact that there are some things that are moving don't want to imply that we're, we're dead in the water. But this avalanche is going to be incredibly problematic. Um, Senator, uh, Judge Greer. Yeah, I, I don't want the committee to think that I was saying that we have to wait until we get herd immunity in order to, to move ahead with trials. Back in November, December, we were prepared to go ahead with the trial in, in Wyndham with or without vaccines. The vaccines weren't out there. As long as we maintain the proper social distancing and masking, and that's the, still the basis on which we're going forward. What I was saying was that it's those elements, the masking and the social distancing will continue for some period of time. Um, and and that's, that's the way we plan on moving forward. Um, I don't know. I don't have an easy solution this morning, um, but I appreciate Eric's research on the on the laws regarding the smaller. I agree with the majority of the committee who said that we <clears throat> we should encourage the Supreme Court to um, consider smaller juries than twelve for civil cases. Um, and that um, we should consider alternative venues. I don't know if that was brought up, but I still think that's an opportunity in some of the communities. Um, and there's a huge gymnasium at Southern Vermont College that is now owned by the Southern Vermont Hospital. It could be a, a resource in my community, um, for example. And I think pretty good ventilation, as I understand it. So there, there would be, you know, maybe one of the things we need to do is consider alternative venues. 
Um, in Bennington, there are three courtrooms, but I don't know how the structure would work for that. I guess Wyndham is a little better. But, uh, I think we also have to be willing to uh, say that some cases from Bennington County need to be heard in Wyndham County. Some cases from other counties need to be heard in other counties without um, signaling that we're doing away with the Bennington County court system. And maybe we can't we use- need all, We need all the courtrooms we can get, Senator. Yeah, and, but maybe we can't use, at this point in time, I'm thinking of the Bennington Courthouse for civil trials. That may not be an ideal situation that would be able to be used in the near future. Um, and who knows what the new normal is going to be. I mean, that, that's, um, but I think there's general agreement that we need to get back to at least moving the backlog um, forward. And so um, if it takes a, a consensus of the committee and Eric can uh, draft something as a consensus of this committee to send over to the Supreme Court, I'm happy to do that. But it sounds like you're already considering these options. Yes, Senator, the um, Supreme Court and the committees that advise the court are actively considering um, the issues we've discussed today. I like Joe's idea of having the governor also be part of that um, executive order. I don't know if that makes a difference or not, but it certainly seems like it would have more weight or a lot of weight with the public anyway. To summarize where we're at on the issue of the civil trials and criminal trials, I think we're Eric, um, hopefully the um, folks will take back and try to ask the Supreme Court to um, look at the issue of whether or not there should be jury trials of six, that it would be better for them to promulgate that than for us to try to do it in legislation. That's pretty much the summary of the committee. Um, is there a desire to send a note on behalf of the committee to the executive branch as well? Is our concern about the startup of uh, civil and criminal jury trials and the backlogs that we're looking at? Would that be something that you think might help? I don't think it can hurt. Can you do something like that, to, Eric? But I just don't want to conflate civil trials and criminal trials with a six member jury panel. No, no, obviously no. You're right. But that at least to, some, to somehow um, look at alternatives and to that, that it is a problem that needs to be addressed. The executive judicial branches can perhaps suggesting to the executive branch that they help the judicial branch with resources needed to accomplish. Yeah, if it, that what you're asking me, Senator Sears, I could certainly uh, draft yeah. up a, a letter from the committee that, you know, uh, yes. suggested that to the court. <laughs> and to the executive branch that the resources be available to, to the judiciary to move this forward. Who would be, any thoughts on who would be the executive would, branch recipient? I would think uh, um, Suzanne Young, the Secretary of Administration. Right, that's Jay, a good idea. And Jay Persian Johnson, the governor's legal Sounds good. Are there others that you can think of in the executive? No, I think Suzanne Young and the governor, and Mark Levine. I don't know. Well, yeah, the Department of Health would certainly have a role there in terms of making sure that whatever we do is 
within the guidelines of the CDC or the DOH. Any yeah. comments from anyone? Uh, Pat Gable, Judge Grierson, Terry, or Chris Maley are still on the line. So. I, don't know. Well, Senator, I, just, uh, I just appreciate, and the judiciary appreciates the uh, cooperation of the committee in um, addressing these really challenging issues. So we look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. We do. I don't have anything, but thank the committee and Senator Sears for your. Yeah. Uh, Terry, if there's any thoughts from the Bar Association on how to move this forward to you, certainly can, they could weigh in with the court. Great, and the judiciary has been great about involving the bar in the jury restart committee, AO 49 discussions and um, we, we also so much appreciate your committee's work on this. All right, with that, we'll move on to something else.